Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is Dr. Amy Or Ewan, an apologist and an evangelist. Amy or Ewan, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you, John. It's so great to be here. L always love seeing you, Amy. Likewise. Now, I'm very intrigued about your parents. Your parents were atheists. Yeah. As were their parents. Uh, but something supernatural happened to your father. Yeah, Tell that's us about right. that. Yeah, so actually my mum's parents were probably kind of nominal Anglicans, but my, yeah, my dad's parents were atheists. My f grandfather was a research scientist. Um, they were in, um, in Eastern Europe un under Russian occupation and ended up escaping from that and coming to the UK as, as refugees after the war. My grandfather... I think partly through the suffering he'd seen in the world, partly through the sort of scientific establishment, was so convinced as an atheist that he forbade a Bible in the house. My dad was not allowed to talk about God or mention anything religious. So that was the, the context. Then my dad became an academic and was lecturing um, at university in Australia. My parents were married. And a colleague took him to hear a talk at lunchtime on the resurrection of Jesus. My dad thought, this is absolutely bizarre, you know, to have someone talking about truth and Jesus in the same sentence. You know, that's a, a, a completely false kind of sentence to put those two things together. So that did sort of set him thinking. One thing the speaker said was the only reason you should be a Christian is it's true. And he just thought, load of rubbish. A few months later, he was at home marking some exam papers in his study and he had a vision of Jesus and he saw his life flashing before him. It was over two hours and he experienced the reaction on the face of Jesus to different things in his life. Actually, what we would call conviction of sin. Of course. But he didn't have that language at all. And then he saw Christ on the cross and he realised he was being offered forgiveness and he just knelt on his study floor and thought, I need to say something. And so he said the words that came into his mind, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That is remarkable. While he's marking exam papers, yeah. he has this yeah. vision. But then obviously our early childhood was shaped by really the impact of Jesus on my parents. So they, they were just all in. They felt God calling them to sell everything and move back to the UK. My dad then became an evangelist and church planter. Amazing. Um, but it was, a, it was a completely radical faith that was you know, open to questions because that was their background. You know, they valued the life of the mind, but it was just undeniably true that true. Jesus broke into to their lives and actually into our lives as well. So tell us about your own faith. Can yeah. you remember when it became a reality for you? Um, I remember as a child, about six or seven, really hearing the gospel myself and um, wanting to pray that prayer, wanting relationship with Jesus myself. And then I think at university, um, so I studied theology at Oxford, which everyone always says, you, you'll lose your faith if you do yes. that. In yes. fact, the interviewer, my Oxford interview said, what are you going to do if you come here to this university and all your you know, naive little ideas about the Bible collapse? You know, how are you going to cope with that? So that, that was very much their stance. Um, and so I think that that period of time of really questioning and having a lot of doubt thrown at me was a, a really refining process in my faith as well. And I came out of that experience more convinced yes. that the gospel is true, that the Bible can be trusted and that we should be proclaiming Jesus to the world. <laughs> so I think as a child, I made a decision then as a teenager again. And then I would say as a, as a young adult too. Amazing. Now, you met your husband, um, yeah. Francis, yes. who's known as Frog That's at right. Oxford as well. Yeah. And both of you passionate about Jesus. You uh, went on a, was it a YWAM ministry trip? 
and you went to Prague and the first time you spoke yeah. was in Prague. Yeah, so when I was 15, the Berlin Wall had just come yes. down, Eastern Europe had opened and we went on, I think it was a five week trip around Czechoslovakia as it then was. And yeah, this was very formative. So we were in Wenceslas Square, you know, that beautiful yeah. square. And the, the openness to the gospel was unlike certainly anything I had experienced. There was this just this feeling of hunger, I think, for truth and for something different than communism had offered. And so we were there, we'd, we'd done our kind of set, there was sort of drama and music. And then the, the leaders would, would often give the message, but one yes. of them just turned to me and said, I feel God is saying, yes. you need to give the message. So I'm 15 with no training at all, really, and handed the microphone. There's over a thousand people there and it's being translated. I mean, yes. you know what that's oh, like. Oh, hard now. work. And I think, I, I, don't, I can't remember at all what I said and I'm sure it wasn't very good, but God used of it. Of course, he uses and, it. Yeah, people just came flooding forward and kneeling and accepting Christ. Um, it, was, it was amazing. Now, growing up, Amy, I know you were inspired uh, by an apologist called Josh McDowell, yeah. as I was uh, yeah. when I was doing university missions. I mean, his books uh, were so inspirational. Yeah. Um, and you're an apologist. Yeah. What, what is an apologist? Yeah, so um, that word apologetics comes from a word in the Greek New Testament, apologia, where it's 1 Peter 3.15 is one example. Always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope. So it's really speaking to all of us as Christians that when people ask us, why are you different? What is it about you that gives you hope? Or, you know, the, the difference that your life is making and, and it's causing people to ask. What you say when that question is asked is apologetic. Yes. So it's, it's, I guess, reasons as to why Christian faith is true. So in the ancient world, um, the Greeks use that word to describe what a lawyer would do in court. Yes. So if you were on trial for something and your defence lawyer stands up and they speak on your behalf, they're speaking persuasively, they're using evidence and they're trying to, to tell everyone the truth of the matter about you. And, and that's basically what apologetics is, is, that we do that as the church. We, we tell everyone persuasively on the basis of evidence who Jesus is and why he brings hope. Uh, your recent book is Where is God in All the Suffering? And uh, I, 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 you sent me this early on, Amy, and I found it so helpful. Uh, you, you wrote it during lockdown. What prompted you <laughs> <laughs> to write it? Yeah, so in some senses, I would say this is something I've been writing for 20 yes, years. Of course. I think um, this is a question that all of us face as Christians, but particularly anyone involved in evangelism in trying to share yeah. who Jesus is with people who don't believe, because it's just such an obvious question. Absolutely. How could there be a loving God and this be the world there is? You know, how could my child have died? How could I have this experience of domestic violence? What about that tsunami that happened? You know, what about mental health? You know, how, how can we proclaim a loving God when he doesn't seem to do anything about and, this And then at the world? beginning, Amy, of the, yeah. you tell the story of your friend yeah. who died. So this is not theory. Yeah. So your friend who died, I think, was she 36? Yeah. And left very young children yeah. and a husband. So you're grappling with something quite personal. Yeah. And did you have any doubts? Yeah. Well, so what? So one of the things I wanted to do in the book was to really draw on personal experiences. I think sometimes with this question, we can say, look, there's this sort of blob, theoretical blob called suffering, and like here's the answer. And actually, that's not how it works. As Christians, we go through horrific suffering and... All of us, if we're human, are going to ask personally, how can this be happening? How can you, a loving God, be letting this happen? And as I walked into Brenda's funeral, I was actually holding her baby yeah. and walked behind the coffin. Um, 
I'm asking God, where are you? Are you good? And are you even here? Now, on one level, of course, I know God is good and I know he's real. And at a fundamental level, I don't think I, I doubted that, but I'm definitely asking and articulating the question. And what I found really amazing, and as, as I talk about in the book, is actually the Bible gives us the language to yes. do that. Yes. So the Bible describes the suffering world that we experience. And you have a whole book, Lamentations, devoted to people's experience of the devastation of war. You have Job asking question after question about to God and about him. You have the psalmist saying, how can this be continuing so long, God? Where are you? You have Habakkuk saying, why are you silent? You're doing nothing, God, in this suffering world. So even our questions are given voice by the Bible. And I think that's unique in any other worldview, that God actually welcomes our questions and even our doubts. So so the question of the book, Amy, where is God in all the suffering? So where is God? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so obviously I'm taking a whole book to, um, to, to, to answer that. I think I'd probably want to draw out two key things. Yes. One would be to say, that even our rage, when we raise the question of suffering, so one of the stories I tell is standing um, at the foot of Grenfell Tower two yeah. days after the fire, and we're there with this community who are in grief, and Psalm 147 is read out, God is close to the brokenhearted, next verse is read out, next verse, verse six, the wicked he will cast to the ground. Okay, during that Bible reading, the whole crowd erupt into applause. They start clapping the idea that there might be a God who will do something about the injustice of this world. Yes. Now, what worldview is able to account for that? Can evolution, the survival of the fittest, we're just here by chance, and you and I are just the stuff of our physical bodies. All you are is the biochemistry of your body. Does that idea account for why we feel as we do when children burn to death in a fire? I don't think it does. Does karma account for it? You get what you deserve in this life. So if somebody is burned in a fire, they did something to deserve it in this life or a previous life. I don't think that can account for how we um, experience suffering in the world. Only the idea that a loving God has made this world and he's created human beings in his image, the sacredness of human life, only that can account for how we feel about suffering, our cry for justice. So where is God in all the suffering? His image is on you and it's on me and it's on every person who's suffered and that's why suffering hurts and that's why it matters because people matter. So that's the first thing I'd say. There's a sort of, like an explanation that, is in our DNA as to how we feel about suffering because God is imprinted in us and on us, a loving God. And then secondly, where is God in our suffering? Well, actually, the Bible doesn't speak of a God who observes suffering and kind of empathizes with us and feels really sad for us from a distance. But God in Jesus willingly suffers himself. He takes sin and death and suffering into himself. So it is now an experience that God himself is prepared to go through. So at the cross, we see this beautiful portrait, a demonstration, the Bible says, of the love of God that, that is him suffering. So he's in it with us. And then of course, there's a future hope too. But um, yeah, that, that's the beginning of the answer. I know. But for all the people that are viewing now, Amy, uh, and are struggling with yeah. uh, loss, yeah. uh, you know, bereavement, or they're, they're going through chemotherapy, yeah. or their children are sick, yeah. um, what, what would you say to them yeah. about taking hold of those principles amidst that pain? Yeah. So the first thing I would say is that your pain actually matters and your pain is is seen and it's acknowledged 
by a loving God. So sometimes in the church you might hear, you know, well, just have faith and, and don't ask why this is happening. But actually God and, and doesn't do that's that. That's awful, isn't it, as yeah. well? Because, uh, and also you didn't have faith. Yeah, and this has why caused it. Like this, this has is caused some sort it. Of, and that's yeah. terrible, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And so damaging for people. So damaging, actually, Jesus when he's asked, you know, why did the tower fall on these people? Yes. He doesn't say they deserved it. He just no. says quite the opposite. Yeah. So I would say to some anyone who's going through loss that um, your experience of grief when you lose someone that you love really matters to God. Of course. And that the depth of the pain that you're going through is more than the sum of the part of their body dying. Yes. The depth of the pain you're going through is is fundamentally known by God and explained actually by God. And he doesn't leave you in that alone. No. He offers his, his love, his presence by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't say, you know, you've done something to deserve this. Or if that miracle you prayed for didn't happen, it's because you didn't have enough faith. He's actually... Um, he's actually with you in that pain and suffering in, in a really powerful way. So um, certainly in my own life, I've experienced that. And for me, um, my husband Frog's father died. Um, so obviously we had Brenda's death, but we also had um, the loss of the grandfather yes. of my boys, you yes. know, really beloved person in our lives. And um, knowing that the length of time you experience loss as well it doesn't it's not just something no, you get over in a week this course. is this is something you go through over a long period of time um that that too is acknowledging the preciousness of that person and actually god's love for that person too and for you absolutely yeah. now you um as an apologist for many years amy you've traveled around the world you've spoken at universities uh, you've spoken to politicians, you've engaged with um, people who are atheists or other worldviews, but you're convinced about Christianity. What is it that convinces you that Christianity is true? Wow, <laughs> how long have we got? On? <laughs> For me, there are two elements to this. There's an intellectual element. Yes. And there's an experiential element. And... I can't really separate those two, but it's sometimes helpful for people to to um, to probe into two, those two things separately. So evidentially, I'm convinced that Christianity is true on the basis of the historical evidence around um, the person of Christ, the gospel narratives, which I have really, really studied and looked at all the objections to them. Yes. And ultimately, the resurrection of Jesus, the empty tomb that there is no better explanation for that empty tomb than that Jesus was who he said he, he was, that he's God and that he conquered death and that he's actually left an imprint on history that yes. we can verify, that we can look into. For me, there's a an experiential element to it. So um, I couldn't deny to you having met Christ because I've met him. I mean, it would be like me denying to you that I'd met Frog. Yes. And my experience of Christ, and I have really thought about this, is more than wish fulfillment. This is not something that I was predisposed to believe. My family, you know, had this intervention from outside despite every predisposition to disbelieve. Okay, so, um, this is an intervention from outside, and I know that to be the case in my own life, partly because Jesus actually challenges me about things. You know, it's not, it's not all, you know, lovely and easy. No. There's, a, there's a sort of discipleship element to it. So, so knowing Christ and experiencing his love for me, his work in my life, his work of healing in my life, his work of forgiveness and redemption and all of those things. Yeah. So for you, uh, Amy, what what difference has Christianity made to you? Well, all the di all the difference in the world. Um, how to narrow it down? I think um, it's just so fundamental to live your life experiencing the love of a loving God, 
that doesn't require you to pretend that you've met some religious standard, but that is utterly unconditional love and to experience his forgiveness. I think that means that you go through every situation in life with a totally different basis and a totally different um, grounding because you know who you belong to, you know that you're loved, you know that you're forgiven. So for anyone uh, listening now, Amy, they've got questions, um, they're not sure, that they haven't really explored the evidence, they probably maybe don't know how to do that. Yeah. and not sure actually, well, what is it, when we're talking about Christianity, what actually are we talking about? What would you say? So I'd say um, in order to explore the evidence, we could sort of point you in certain direction to to watch something or, or read something or listen to something. In terms of what are we actually talking about? What's the What's the nub of this? What we're talking about is that we're not here by chance. Yeah. We're not just slime on a random planet. We're not just our biochemistry, but you and I have been created intentionally by a loving God, that we are loved by him. This world has gone wrong. We've exercised our choice to harm people as well as done good in this world. But there's forgiveness on offer and relationship with our loving creator on offer through Jesus. And all we have to do is, is come to him honestly and say to him, and when I say say to him, I mean you can just think it or even say it out loud, God, I think I need you, I think I need your forgiveness and I would like a relationship with you, it is that simple. You can ask God to reveal himself to you through Christ. Well, Amy, could you um, speak to our viewers? And for anyone that would like to do that now, would you lead them in that prayer, please? I'd love to do that. Yeah, so um, if that is you, if if you are listening to this and you're thinking, um, I need that, I need forgiveness. And I do believe that a loving God exists, but I know there's this gap between us. God is just a prayer away from us through Jesus. So why don't we open our hearts to him and pray right now? And what I'm gonna pray is really simple. It sort of follows a... Um, a pattern of of saying sorry, thank you, and please. We're saying sorry to God for the distance between us and the things that um, we've actually done wrong in this life and the way we've ignored him. And the thank you is to thank Jesus for his death on the cross. And the please is to ask for God to come into our lives by the power of of his Holy Spirit and actually begin that relationship with us. So why don't we do that? A sorry, thank you, and please. So God, I I come to you now acknowledging the distance between us, acknowledging things that I have done wrong in my life, that have hurt others, that have hurt you, that have violated um, your world and your goodness. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my part in the brokenness in this world. Thank you, Jesus, for coming in history and revealing God to us. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I accept that gift of forgiveness that you offer. Please will you now come into my life and make me new. Please, will you fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can begin that relationship with you. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful, Amy. I, I like your sorry, uh, thank you, please. And it, it really is as simple as that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, we, and we can have that assurance, can't we, that the Lord has heard that prayer yeah. and has begun a new thing in our lives and uh, uh, I like what Jesus said to Nicodemus it's like being born again yeah and and you can start feeling that newness yeah Um, for for our viewers what would you encourage them those that prayed that prayer and others um, 
maybe they haven't read the Bible in a little while or they haven't got a Bible. Okay, but let's say they'll get a Bible. What would yeah. you advise them? How would you advise them to read it? Where should they start? Yeah. So um, I would I would say, uh, personally, either start with Mark's Gospel or John's Gospel. So whichever you prefer, which name you prefer, <laughs> go with either of those. And um, I would encourage you, if you've prayed that prayer, to consider just taking an hour and a half actually to read the gospel through from beginning to end in one sitting and ask Jesus to be speaking to you as you do that. And then perhaps to make a habit each day, maybe just take 10 or 15 minutes to read a chapter of the other gospel each morning um, and ask God to speak to you by by his Holy Spirit and begin to try and pray each day. So that would be a sort of starting point. And then I think if you don't know any other Christians, if you, you know, you're not in, you haven't got some Christian in your life trying to drag you to church, um, think about looking out for a, a local church that you could become a part of or maybe you know check out a few online initially um, and 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 start to find other people who are also Christians who you can do this journey with. Amy always a delight thank you so much um, for joining us on Facing the Canon. Thank you. You're John. always um, very inspiring and uh, and can I just encourage you just to keep on doing the work of an apologist. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for having me. Can I encourage you that if this question is a big question for you, where is God in all the suffering? I'd really encourage you to read Amy's book. Um, I, I've read many books um, on this topic, uh, but I found this just really uh, inspiring and it kind of renewed my, my thinking uh, and I learned a number of new things and new insights. So I really would encourage you. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon and please join us again. Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You are not here in the world for yourself. You have been sent here for others. The world is waiting for you. The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. We need a fresh vision of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news.